I've been right, trying to get to this AFP audience for quite a while. Uh, it's my belief there's a serious amount of support for our initiative in the conservative com community. And I hope uh, I'll be able to uh, convince those on defense to, to vote yes come in May. Um, Elise Higley, actually I'm here to represent GMO Free Jackson County, but mostly our Family Farms Coalition, the other group of farmers who support this. Elise Higley, the director, is driving down I-5 in Los Angeles. Uh, there was a mix-up on her plane. She has to be there for the weekend. Uh, Elise would probably be the primary speaker, but we didn't want to miss this opportunity. And Tom will tell you that we almost, <laughs> we, we tried in December, it didn't work. We tried in January, I mean, this is, so anyway, so rather than miss this again, we decided to come and uh, you know, make it happen. So I'm not a pinch hitter. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a in the lineup, shall we say, but uh, anyway, so I'm here representing both GMO Free Jackson County and our Family Farms Coalition. Okay, I want to start off with a short audio clip uh, from a farmer here named Jared Water who spoke at the uh, county commissioners yesterday. I'm not sure if you've watched RVTV, uh, but I'm going to do the, I, it's hard to get the audio video clip. I do have an audio clip. I'd like to start with that. So. Let me go to the next slide, and it's, uh, let me see if I can push the button here, and it comes out, we'll be lucky. I had my challenge before the night was getting the sound to work, and it always helps me put the cable into the wrong sp right spot. Oops. Hang on. Can you, t where's the turn off for this? Can we turn it down temporarily so I can lean, lean forward? And because my sounds that come through that speaker, I want re-feedback. Thank you. My name is Jared Waters. I'm a longtime resident of Jackson County, and I'm a native Oregonian. My family has been for over 80 years in the state. I, I'm the operations manager for one of the largest conventional farming operations in the valley. We are not organic. We are nearly 2,400 acres. We are all conservative Republicans and part of the Jackson County Republican Party that helped elect you, all you gentlemen to office. We do not. We do not want, not out of state, but out of country corporations controlling the way we farm here in the valley. Last year, my farm took a quarter million dollar hit when the wheat export ban hit last summer. We could not export our crop. By the time that the ban was lifted, we could no longer combine our crops and ship them to Portland because the little rain that we have received this year came. When wheat's wet, you can't combine it. I had to plow it under, and I lost a lot of money. Um, we know Measure 15-119 will have no economic impact on this valley, on the county, and its taxpayers. We support Measure 15-119, and we are appalled by the Commission's lack of research on the subject. Thank you for your time. So, uh, anyway, that's a local farmer. And I'll give you my, my sound up. And here we go again. And I'd say I'm not so much here to talk about genetic engineering as I'm about the impact of genetic engineering agriculture and its possible impacts on our county and why we think supporting local family farms is the way to go. So I'm going to talk about uh, what's the threat to our farmers, what does a family farms measure do, who supports it, and why local citizens should support the family measure as well. Okay, just a quick crash course to make sure we understand what we're talking about here. Genetic engineering is a modern technique to indu and, and induce transgenic uh, DNA material across species lines. The top line's a, a tangerine and a pomelo, and you get a tangelo, that's hybridization. You take genes from a fish, a biorad gene gun is what the, I mean, it looks like Buck Rogers, but and uh, they, you know, they inject that in and they grow tomatoes that are, have certain attributes or traits that they're after. Now, the issue though is it comes out as patented intellectual property disguised as food. That food and the seeds that come, uh, that come with it belong to a private entity, okay? There's some implications of that later on, but that's just a quickie crash course. Is this off? Yeah. Oops, wrong way. So, uh, what are some of the threats of genetically engineered crops in the county? Uh, contamination of traditional farm crops, right? 
Economic risk to the local economy. Jared Waters lost a quarter million bucks. Patent lawsuits against farmers. Now you can go to the, uh, uh, the threat is there. Uh, Monsanto may say, well, in 20 years we've only had a 145 lawsuits. That's not many. Well, they don't tell you there's thousands, over 5,000 documented settlements that are non-disclosure. Uh, they come and they b basically bully the farmer into complying and they sign a non-disclosure agreement and they keep it secret. And, and despite what you may hear, okay, it does involve increased uh, use of herbicides. There's a lot of controversy of that. You'll probably hear that's not the case. I think if you do a little bit of research on the internet, look up uh, Dr. Ben Brooks' study from Washington State University. Uh, again, there's pretty good evidence that a chemical company who's in the business of selling chemicals is likely to come up with a product that uses more chemicals. All right, let's talk about Jackson County. Okay, who here knows about the ash and peach? Okay, ja Jackson County has been a world famous source of agriculture for over 120 years. All right, Max Pratt in Ashland, south of, uh, south of the fire department there, that was a peach orchard. Through pruning and uh, uh, techniques, he was able to grow, now check this out, a peach at 26 ounces, 26 ounces and a 16 inch circumference. That's the size of a cantaloupe, folks. <laughs> That's a hell of a peach. Anyway, he took, the, he took best to show at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, which kind of put America on the map economically. Harry and David, nearly 100 years ago, the Royal Riviera pear and their whole product line. All right, a lot of people don't know this. In the 1950s, talent right up that way. I think, it, no, I see it. Okay, talent had the best alfalfa on the planet. Rogue River, branded town alfalfa, high yield. Now it's been supplanted by modern hybrids, but for a long time, this valley produced the best alfalfa seed in the United States. So we have a long history of producing high quality agricultural products. Okay, are non-GMO products that are not organic an important consumer market? You betcha. Cheerios, non-GMO. General Mills, it's no, there are no pikers when it comes to marketing. They know, they came out, now they didn't do much to it to make it non-GMO. There's no such thing as GMO oats. All right, but they realize there's a huge market in their customer base for people who do not want genetically modified ingredients in their food. All the other products on that page are all not organic, but non-GMO. There's a large market for this. Our, our farmers who want to sell to that can and should be able to without the threat of losing their ability to sell. Okay. Uh, genetic engineering seeds and pollens, you know, do get out. They cause problems. Bayer had to play a lot of money. You know, I, please don't read this whole slide. This is some news clips documenting the fact that when a, a genetic engineered rice got out in the wild, it cost, it cost Bayer a lot of money to settle up. Uh, here in Oregon, um, what Jared referred to, 30, I think it was 30, 30 uh, genetically engineered plants, uh, wheat plants, were found in the field. Farmer prepped this field, sprayed it, 30 of those plants didn't die. Um, word got, he went and, you know, what's going on here? And uh, they were identified as Monsanto strain, genetically engineered wheat. It was supposed to have been removed from the market 10 years ago uh, while it was under permit and destroyed. It obviously wasn't. It got out somehow. They don't know how. They never determined it. But what happened? Okay, 90% of our Oregon's wheat crop goes to Japan and South Korea. Well, it's actually exported, maybe it's not that high a percentage. But the fact of the matter is those contracts were canceled, all right, because those countries, sovereign countries with a right to determine their food, all right, said we don't want this stuff. Um, and uh, you know, someone like Jared got caught in the crossfire. Again, customers out there demand products that don't have it. All right. Um, so, what's the issue here? Now, I, I, is, do I have a laser pointer, Tom? Is it? Do we have one that works. Is it this one? This one? Okay. And the pointer? Do I just push like that? Where do I push? Here? No. There. Oh, okay. All right. Here's the map. All right. It's a little hard to see. I'm outline it for you. There's Ashland. There's Talent. There's Phoenix. There's Medford. The gray area along here is the Bear Creek watershed, okay? Peak to peak. This is our, our major valley here, okay? That's what that is. 
The green dots represent farmers who grow biologic methods. Some are organic, some are not, laid up by their non-GMO farms, all right? Okay, when you understand that the USDA's safe separation distance for sugar beet seed production is considered to be four miles. Now, it's been deregulated. They don't care where you grow it now, but when they get a permit, it's supposed to be kept four miles apart as a safe separation distance. So around each uh, green dot, you'll see a four-mile radius circle. Got that? So what do you notice? It doesn't take many farms to start stepping on each other for genetic... Uh, cross-pollination issues. The red dots represent known or suspected sugar beet seed plots, most of them done by a foreign corporation who plants very close to biologic neighbors. We get more support for our initiative from this map than any single item. Now, okay, gee, Brian, it's legal, it's deregulated, what's the big deal? We have to realize we did this map uh, in March in March of 2012. Sugar beet seeds were not deregulated until July of 2012. That means that these plots were grown in a violation of issued permits, all right, and that's not what I call a particularly good neighbor. So that's the map. That's And then and alfalfa, uh, USD alpha, uh, alfalfa, uh, safe separation distances were just recently released. Three miles of honeybees are used in the pollination process for seed production. Again, like the old Western movie, this town may not be big enough for the both of us. So, okay. All right. Um, now, uh, Ron's here. This is a report from Ron Bjork, our opposition. This is a letter to the editor, Mail Tribune. Is there a risk of genetically modified alfalfa cross-pollinating with conventional al alfalfa? Absolutely. Okay, even our opposition agrees it's a risk. Now, Ron's got a different solution on, you know, he's entitled to his, his opinion, but that's a, that's a statement we got from the paper, okay? Uh, it is a problem and can be a problem. The question is what to do about it. Who bears the cost of genetically engineered crops in Jackson County? I'm going to run another video clip of Steve Fry. Steve Fry is from Fry Family Farms. He's going to talk about the impact on his farm and his experience with some of the, quote, good neighbors here. So. Let's see if I can get it going again. Uh, on. Okay, let's give it a... If I do this, that might help. Let's see. Uh. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Fry. I am um, a talent resident, and I am an organic grower here in the Valley. Uh, Fry Family Farm is the name of our company. We've been in this Valley 20-some years. And being an organic grower, uh, this GMO thing totally affects me. Uh, so I do have some emotional attachment to the equation, although the scientific part of the equation is really what I'm here to speak about. I am one of the growers that have lost crops, just for the record. It would be really great if we could have some kind of estimate on how much money we've lost on this deal. And Mr. Jordan, I don't know, I want to talk evil about you, you're a good man, I know that. <laughs> you, you do good work, County. Um, but uh, the problem, I have lost crops. The economic uh, impact on my farm and my business has been substantial. We lose thousands of dollars a year because the GMO seed crops are grown. I have three different farms in this valley. Um, I have GMO crops growing around all my properties. I joined the Seed Association to try to get some clarity on where the GMOs are and how many GMOs uh, could be in this valley. Uh, Syngenta is the main player here. I know many other, there's only like three crops that are being grown in this valley, uh, field corn, alfalfa, and the GMOs, sugar beets. Those are the three GMOs we're talking about. Um, for me to grow uh, the beta family seeds, I can't legally, I can't legitimately do it because Syngenta walked out of our seed growers meeting. We tried to coexist. That model has been tried. The, at, at the meeting, they got up and told us we can't do this. They walked out of the meeting for the record. They left the coexistent model. And I just want you all to know 
that we have worked with these people. And me being in this valley for as long as I have, I have known where they're at because they come to me and say, would you get rid of those charred plants? They're contaminating my beets. I'm still pulling leaves off my chart. I can't do that. I sell the stuff. So we've been going through this for some time. Um, so the coexistent model, I want to work with farmers, our neighbors. These people are from another country. The guy that's growing the plants, he, I can work with him. Although this last encounter I had with him, I said, I'm growing seed this year. He said, okay, fine. Right out here at Extension, we're not going to plant it. Fry, I've worked with you a long time. You're a good guy. We've done this. He wants to show some rate coexisting, as neighbors do. Uh, I'm driving out there in Hanley. There they are, planting sugar beet plants. After he told me they weren't going to, I question uh, Jesse Bimbo. What's going on? What are you guys doing? They told me we had to plant. Coexistence does not exist in this valley, and that's you know an economic hardship on the seed growers. I just wanted to put that in the record. Thank you, guys. Okay, well, that's a pretty compelling story. That was yesterday's county commissioners meeting, by the way. Uh, that's a picture of the rest of Fry Family Farms. Who else might have issues with it? Uh, Chuck Burr is in the room. You can talk to him. Had to destroy $5,000 of charred seeds because he was too close to the, well, actually the other side planted too close to him. Um, Abbey Lane Farms, 22 years an organic farmer, used to save his own chard and beet seeds and grow them and sell them in the market. A uh, chilling effect of GMOs is he no longer wants to take the risk, so he's stopped growing it. He's now forced to buy seeds from outside the area. And he spends 20 years developing a seed line that does well in our, our local geography, and uh, he has to give it up. Chris Hardy, the other co-petitioner, he had a Fedco seed contract. They canceled it given his relationships with the uh, and closeness to the uh, competition. Who else? Maybe you. You ch Any gardeners here to save your seeds? More than a few? Okay. Would you like to have them not be co uh, intellectual corporate property? Maybe you want to consider not having them uh, parked in the valley so close to you. Jackson County could be a haven for that. All right. Um, now, you know, I, I'm not going to dwell too on this, but, you know, it's Forbes, you know, even ran the article, genetically engineered crops do increase herbicide use, okay? Uh, and some of this stuff's kind of tricky. Well, you know, we put, we, we, st we don't have to spray BT on the cornfield anymore because it's in the plant. Well, the net BT impact on the field is pretty high because they grow the BT in the corn. But, yeah, they spray less. They just grow it right inside the plant. Um, and uh, increased reeds also really to uh, well, increased herbicide use leads to uh, super weeds. Uh, I got a letter in the editor about a couple weeks ago. Uh, in fact, this was in the Delta Ag Press. The Idaho potato growers, the University of Tennessee, came out. Their weed scientist said, "Hey, ten years ago, we never considered people were going to have to go out and hand pull super weeds out of the ground." Italian ryegrass in, in, in Mississippi. Um, it, it, this idea that herbicides are no-till. Well, guess what? When superweeds show up, how do you get rid of them? Well, you put more glyphosate than you used to, and probably dicam and 2,4-D, and you have to plow it in so that the weeds don't grow back in the spring. So there's a lot of problems emerging from this, and it's not as simple as, well, it just uses less. Okay, and increasing herbicide use increases risk to our drinking water and kids. Go to, go to Google and, 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 and just Google a American Academy of Pediatrics Pesticide. You can read the whole thing. They say here that children encounter pesticides every day and are uniquely vulnerable to their toxicity. And they make recommendations on how to reduce exposure. All right? And yes, people spray too, but they don't spray the stuff that, you know, that, that, uh, that these people are talking about. So think about your kids and your water. Um, genetically engineered crops expose farmers to patent infringement litigation and threats. I talked about that a little earlier, okay? It's not a passive deal. Most people don't know when you sign 
a GMO contract. In fact, you can go to hell on the seeds here and ask him, how do you get, I'm going to buy a bag of GMO corn. He says, well, you've got to register with Monsanto as a Monsanto grower. And then they'll send you a contract you have to sign. And you'll get a bag of seed that says, hey, if you open this bag, you consent to all the items in your technical use agreement. Now, I ain't on the bag, all right? That might be something that was in the paperwork you got. But most, I suggest you all do faircontracts.org and look at a typical GMO contract. Or go to the University of Arkansas, they have a guideline for farmers in GMOs. When you sign a GMO contract, and again, there are slight differences, I'm not saying they're all this way, but you give, up, you give Monsanto non-expiring rights. That means lifetime rights to enter your property, examine your books, including your federal and, and state tax records. You, you yield that power to them. If you don't like your experience with the seeds, you do, you're under contractual agreement not to talk about it. You're, 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 you're basically, you're, you're, uh, they zip your lips. You can't talk in public under threat of non-disclosure agreements. Uh, you don't like it? Then you have to go to Missouri to sue. All right. There's, there, there, anyway, these things put people under risk. And if they don't do all the, uh, all the stuff they're supposed to do, guess who's knocking on the door? <clears throat> so, that's, uh, let's talk about the uh, measure itself, okay? Um, to hear our county commissioners talk, man, this is hard stuff. It has eight pages long. Oh, God, what are we going to do? Big words, too. <laughs> Look, here's a prohibition. It says it's a county ordinance, county violation for any person to, to propagate, cultivate, raise, or grow genetically engineered crops within Jackson County, all right? And there's some definitions in there which are pretty clear in spite of the, uh, some of the opponents' uh, willingness to try and confuse the issue. So, um, it, it, you know, by the way, if you want to read, I didn't bring copies of it. You can go to our website, ourfamilyfarms.org. Uh, a copy is there. You can log into Jackson County's uh, website. They have it there. It's out there. Most of it, most of it has to do with defining the administrative procedures and abatement procedures used in case there is a violation. And guess what, folks? It's copied on existing 21-year-old Jackson County law. There's a pear ordinance here 21 years ago to protect farmers, pear farmers, from damages of abandoned pear orchards. So, you know, most of the language in there is right from that. In fact, even Danny Jordan said, yes, Mr. Combs did cut and paste that language. But then he goes on to, well, I don't want to get into Danny Jordan. So um, it's simple. It does use existing county enforcement for agricultural protection. There's no new bureaucracy uh, mandated in the law. It says it uses current staff and procedures. Persons who violate the law must pay the cost of abatement. All right, it, it's uh, like all laws, the county enforcement has discretion. There's no requirement to use public funds. If the county's up a creek, they can, they can choose to, uh, uh, the level of enforcement they want. There's no mandate that they have to enforce this law. Now, we'd like them to, obviously. But, uh, and, and as citizens are also able to enforce it, the county won't act. But it's existing uh, county law, and it's, uh, it's got definitions that, that, that work and have been tried for years. Okay, so what else has it got? It has an exemption for medical and scientific research. Okay, if OSU wants to do a genetic engineering experience, and they put it into a, you know, the, the USDA has standard levels for biocontainment. If they can put stuff out there and not have the pollen move, it's okay. If a biotech company wants to come and make bioengineered pharmaceuticals, that's okay. We're not trying to take away jobs in this county. We're trying to protect our local family farms. All right. It also has a 12-month grace period. Okay. So, so if you got something in the ground this year, you know, and the law passes, you got a year to plant it, or to harvest it, sell it, and move on to something else. It's not punitive. Okay. Now, who supports it? Okay. Uh, um, well. I have a prop. Okay, a lot of people support this. All right, I'm going to put this up in the back of the room. You can see it afterwards. We have over 150 local farms who support this. Okay, we have 300 businesses and restaurants and organizations here who support this. Our support list is long and it's deep. All right, and it's local. Okay, we don't have 
Uh, if you look at the opposition website, you'll notice that a lot of their supporters seem to come from other states. Okay, uh, five local granges, 100 restaurants and local businesses. The, the, who saw Eric Weisinger's article a few weeks ago on the, uh, about what he called culinary tourism? All right, he's promoting the idea that Jackson County is a special place. People come here to drink well, eat well, have a good time. They do not come here to look at brown glyphosate sprayed GMO sugar beet plots. Okay, this is where the money is. That's why the, the Newman Hotel Group down the street, Larks at the Inn at the Commons, largest hotel in the Valley, they're a science supporter. Why? Because a healthy GMO free economy is where the money's at for most of these people. Our, uh, the other side, Syngenta, what's, well, I think Ag, Agland here runs about $500 a year per acre, okay? If they got 50 plots, what's that? $25,000 into our local economy? Those seeds don't stay here. They're trucked out of here and grown somewhere else. Now, to, to Syngenta, they're worth a lot of money, but it doesn't do you as a citizen here much good at all. So, uh, but uh, Michael, can you come take this and put it in the back? But you can't put it up? Okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll walk around like a sandwich board, you know. <laughs> the end is near. Okay? Well, okay. Um, I'm getting near the end, folks. Okay, so what's it worth? Okay, what happened when Marin County passed the ban? Let's look at some numbers here. Okay, in 2004, Marin County in California passed a ban. $55 million was their actual agro total ag production. 2012, eight years later, okay, it had grown by, uh, the index was 146. It grew by almost half. Okay? Now, Marin County is unique and they break out organic. So I, I, there's no way, I, I look like all over the internet trying to find GMO versus non GMO. It doesn't exist. But there's a breakout for organic in Marin County. They were $4 million in 2004. Eight years later, there were $28 million, a 700% increase, okay? Number of land farmers more than doubled. And it's like that Field of Dreams movie with Kevin Costner. Build it and they will come because they do not have to bear the cost of coexistence. So let's look on a chart, what does that look like? Blue line is total ag economy, green line is organic farmers, and the red line is the value of organic production. 95% of the growth of the 50% of the growth in Marin County came from a, 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 you know, an introduction of organic agriculture there. That's where the money is. Let's look at Santa Cruz County. This is not such a unique thing. Santa Cruz County has $560 million agriculture, okay? Seven times bigger than Jackson County's, all right? They had a ban in 2006. In uh, 2012, their, their economy has grown by 40%. Now, there's no breakout I had in Marin, but the fact of the matter is, you pass a ban, and the ag economy doesn't fall apart, okay, that's our point. It can grow quite substantially with a ban. So keep that in mind. So, and this I'm getting near the end, other concerns of genetic engineering, uh, you know, we can talk about in the Q&A Q period. Uh, most of these I've touched upon. And I got a slide here that, oh, okay, so what's your vision of uh, Marine County, uh, Jackson County's future? And that is, you know, do you, you, know, do you care about our air and water? Well, what about our cropland? That's a picture of short-term glyphosate use in uh, 10 years later, what it looks like. And what about our forests? Okay, anybody who's ever seen a GMO forest? Okay, you might go hiking in that? Okay, well, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, Jackson County's trees, conifer pines, the, the, the Siskiyou Cascade Monument, which, you know, there's a lot of controversy about that. Like it or not, it's one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet, okay? And there's private plots up there, and those people, you know, they like to put in trees and cut them down. The, the problem is, is conifers have a 100-mile pollen range, okay? And you start introducing these traits into our natural forests here, and, you know, maybe you want to go hiking in the future, maybe you don't. So what's your vision for the future of Jackson County? So, uh, I guess I can't run this slide, Mary, but these are the, so we have, anyway, vote yes, I guess, is a short answer. So, I'm going to end... <laughs> I'm going to end my presentation here and take questions. I think I'm in my time limit, right? Yeah. I'm going to get a drink of water, too. No questions? You're all going to vote yes? Great. <laughs> I'm done. Huh? Over here. Yes, you. Yeah, there was a, 
in, in the opposing side, there was a criticism of the law saying that there's an emergency measure in there and trying to make it seem like that was a dangerous provision. Can you explain what that is? Well, are we talking about Senate Bill 863 or the yeah. local ordinance? It's, 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 and I, I copied it out. It's well, okay, I, help me with uh, emergency? In the event of an emergency, the county can go in and pull up the crops. I'm not aware of that language. I'd like to see it. I, I know the pear ordinance. You read section 630. Oh, the pear orchard? No, I don't know. Well, the sections, okay, existing law is section 630. In there, that requires the extension to come in and declare a crop emergency, and then and then that's 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 the I guess the trigger for for, for you know for uh, moving forward. I don't well. I hope it does, you know, my, my understanding that a lot doesn't have it in there. I, I, I'm not going to say, I don't remember the word emergency in there, so I don't, I'm not aware of any emergency provisions where the county can act and accelerate the standard procedures. So, you know, one of the things we added to our initiative that the parish didn't have, we, were, we, we, you know, we vetted this thing. I think Craig Frong said Brian wrote this law. Brian didn't write this law. Uh, we had a team of people doing it. It got vetted by three attorneys. We had a... We had a civil attorney, we had a land use attorney, and we had a food safety attorney go over it. One of the things we stuck in there, before the county can come on your property, they have to get a search warrant, okay? I, they just can't walk on your property and say, hey, give it up. They have to have a reasonable cause, you know, some reasonable uh, basis to do it. So, yeah, about emergency, I'm not aware of that. I'm sorry. Uh, over here. Yeah, maybe I'll possibly a similar question. If this, if this ordinance is passed as an initiative, what's the the possibility that the supervisors, since it's kind of complicated, it's technical, would the supervisors be able to make improvements in it on their own in some future time, or would it have to go back to the mission? It's a county ordinance like any other one. Uh, I don't know, Joel's a, I mean, he's probably your subject matter expert there. I don't, again, I'm not an attorney. All right, but like any county kind of ordinance, if the commissioners choose or don't, the, 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 the fact that it's a citizen's initiative, once it's passed, and it goes into Jackson County code, it's it's not unique in that regard. Wendell, over here. Would you say that the, the, the proliferation of the, of the pollen from GMO plants that, that contaminates uh, the, the plants uh, in non-GMO plants, would you, would you consider that to be a bit of a, uh, a violation of property rights? <laughs> What I consider to be a violation of property rights. I would consider, it, well, well, planning them after the law is passed would be a violation of the ordinance. Okay. But that was the question. Do I consider it tre uh, trespass or violation of property rights just by doing it over? You know, that's, everybody's got their own opinion about that. Uh, you know, is it trespasses? But there's a lot There's a lot of law around that. You know, I want to stick to the yeah, answer that... But just the kind of the, the, the layman's term, if somebody's GMO pollen comes on my land and now I can't grow my non-GMO uh, seed crop because of that. But you're rec okay, patent law trumps property rights. That was a Supreme Court thing a while back. You know, your, your recourse for that is limited. Right, that's one reason we want a law here to do something about it because uh, if you're left with a trespass claim and you go to the, up to the Supreme Court, they said, eh, <laughs> patent rights trump property rights. Over here, and uh, I want to get some... Yeah. In that uh, a report that uh, Danny Jordan did, it, it talked about uh, replacing the topsoil. I find that strange. Can you... Well, <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't write his report. He put in some things that could possibly raise the cost of enforcing this law. Now, keep in mind, Danny said over half a dozen times, this could cost nothing. He said it as a matter of policy for the board to enforce this or not, it ain't his call. Now, the issue on removing topsoil, topsoil removal is something you do for toxic waste dumps. GMO plants are not toxic in and of themselves. They're not like, you know, it's not like Love Canal on a Syngenta plot, okay? They don't need, you know, so though our position is that suggestion that that level of removal would be required was just a big a, a big mistake. I'm not going to get into motives or, or, or anything like that. It just it's in error as a requirement. And there's a, and in fact we have a position paper. His, his his whole paper 
I had uh, quite a number of errors in it that probably, although he may have mentioned them, should not have factored in his cost estimates because it's, it, well, so the short answer is, you know, check uh, Ray Seidler's here. He's a former EPA scientist. He can talk about that with you after the meeting. But uh, top soil removal is six inches down with a bulldozer, all right, to get out. I mean, is that how you weed your garden? Probably not. Okay, so, all right. Um, okay, uh, way in the back. Uh, in your opinion, if Stolen should pass, uh, and someone were to sue the county um, for their right to grow a GMO crop, um, who would bear the burden of defense of that, of that ordinance? If we got sued by our good neighbors? If, if the ordinance were to pass, and the county were to be sued by someone who said they wanted to grow a GMO crop, who would bear the burden of defense of this order? Well, that's up to the county commissioners. Okay, look, it's not not every county defends its own laws. Now, that's, there's a political uh, landmine you may want may want want to get into. All right. Well, I, you know there are other amicus curia people who probably would want to support it. That's up to the. I'm not going to speak for the county commissioners. Would they would they choose to uh, go to court? That's their call. Okay, if they choose, if and only if they choose that, yeah, there there might be county council involved. But let's not, you know, let's don't speculate on the future, all right? Because they can choose not to if they so desire. In fact, I want some of the well. Anyway, I'll I'll stop there. Okay, way back there. Well, okay, I, you know, there's another mystery question, folks. We consistently ask, where are the GMO growers, okay? Uh, you know, uh, we know Syngenta's here, and they, their business model is not, they lease land and grow, the, grow their crops on your land, but, you know, your, your farming involvement might be cashing a check <laughs> from the Syngenta Corporation, okay? There is genetically engineered alfalfa in this county. How much? In a, no one stepped forward and offered that number. Is it a few? Is it a lot? Okay, maybe when the op, I know, maybe this. I'll get all over there in a second. But um, how am I doing time ways, by the way? Okay, but I mean, but the, those numbers. You know, our opinion is the number, the actual number of GMO growers here is low. Okay, the impact on numbers of people might be very small. But we, we, we don't know that answer, and we've tried hard to find it and assessing you know, it. Back there. Um, so I'm a bit curious about uh, the. Oh, yes, first. first. Okay, one back. Oh, um, you go. You go next. The guy behind the head did have his hand up first. Oh, okay, I, I guess I just had a comment to that question. Um, and then a question for you. One, uh, I don't know how many farmers would want to come out and say they grow this in light of destruction of crops and private property rights. Do you know who did that? Did that the past. Do you know who did the destruction? No. No. Okay, well, then we don't either. Well, I, and I'm just saying that could be a reason why some doesn't come forward and say that, but that's just a thought I was thinking. Well, I mean, the part of this. I would, I would like to ask, why would you uh, propose a law uh, but not propose to enforce it? I'm not proposing that. We passed the law, it's up to the county commissioners. And here's the deal. Well, right, I, I, well, let me go. I'm sorry? Is it your name? <laughs> Well, no, my name is not on the ordinance. Yes. My, I, I'm on the petition. I'm listed as a chief petitioner. I got 67. So support it, but why would you support it? Look, I would like to see it enforced, okay? But that's not my call, all right? And, and, and the opposition is saying we have to spend all this money. If this county can't, it's like the pair, okay, Danny Jordan said his report. There's an abatement procedure for pairs. It's not funded. The county's chosen not to fund the abatement. Now, that's a political decision they made. And, I, and I, I'll tell you, I think pair, urbana parishes here are probably a smaller problem than genetically engineered crops, but that's a policy issue for this county commission. The law itself that you're voting on does not require them to do it if they choose not to. And, I, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not going to put Joel on the spot, but it might be a question for the county commissioners. If this law passes, will you enforce it, or will you use good judgment and reasonableness based on the county's ability to do these things. It's not, again, the point is the law does not require it. It could happen, all right, but it, you know, the county, it's up to the county. They've chosen not to abate on pear orchards or even enforce that. That's their choice, but it's up to them. Our law does not mandate enforcement. Question. Um, the food section 
of the uh, throwaway shopping paper a couple weeks ago had a front page article and it said if the uh, food item is marked organic, then you can definitely be sure it's not GMO. Is that true? Okay, y'all hear that question? Yeah. Okay, I'll repeat it. I mean, the ones in the back, I think you can hear, but he said, okay, if it's marked, okay, this question had to do with food labeling. If it's labeled organic, can you be sure it's non-GMO? Um, most of the time, I'd say yes. There's some controversy over small pieces, small bits of genetic engineered product like xanthan gum and things like that. Um, so, you know, you're, you're okay. <laughs> Engineers and mathematicians, if you can only go halfway across the room at a time, the engineers say, uh, well, the mathematicians say we'll never get there, okay? And, and, and the engineers will be close enough, who cares? All right? <laughs> and, and um, you know, that's a matter of your person. The non-GMO project I mentioned, they, I think they have to make sure the top five ingredients on their list are certified non-GMO. Do other things sink, sneak in there? I can't guarantee, you know, isn't, Nothing's a guarantee in this world. In fact, there's even some standards where, at the production level where they collect grains, not grow them, but where they collect them in a big distribution center, they process them. Now, there, you know, there are some allowable percentages in there where you can still call organic, but not a lot. But it's generally, it's true that it's non-injected GMO if uh, it's, it's labeled organic. At this time, that's a common statement. If you want want GMOs. So our Why library will be closing in 30 minutes. We still have well, you're up, you're up a creek. <laughs> 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 um, but, okay, but in general, that's the case. But, you know, again, is it 100%? I, you know, I, nothing's 100% in this world. Okay, well, I have some questions over here. In one of your slides, you added where the citizens could, could enforce it. Yes. I want to know how, how you expect that. Well, uh, <laughs> you file a court case. Okay. Uh, okay, it says this, the citizens and the county are authorized to enforce this ordinance in what they call a court of common, or a court of, uh, what's the word, uh, competent jurisdiction. Now, so that's, you know, uh, citizens are able to bring private actions against what they think an offender are. Now, that's, that's the law. I mean, you can do it, all right? Over here, this guy here, I skipped over him. I mean, I, try. <laughs> I, you know, I got these numbers from the Santa Cruz County Agricultural Report. Okay, it's it's straight up numbers. I don't think there's any like uh, uh, regression statistics trying to do correlation techniques or things like that. Uh, so I, you know, is that was it flat last year because uh, they had a bad year? I don't know. Uh, the fact of the matter is there is an upward trend. I think it's pretty apparent. And then the, my point is, that even though they cross it. You know, the world didn't end agriculturally in Santa Cruz County, and there's a half a billion dollar economy. Over here, well, so Chuck, you're, you're inside. I'm going to get some other people who haven't. Right. Yeah, I'm out of time? Yeah. Well, okay, well then uh, I'll give it to Chuck since he got his hand up. What, what's the actual cost of enforcement in the counties that have done this in the past? The actual, well, here's the deal they don't publish the number. All right. Uh, we think it would have been pretty easy to. Well, I, we got on the phone. We called up Mary Lou Nicoletti, Santa Cruz County uh, Ad Commissioner. Do you have an enforcement cost? No. <laughs> we called up Stephen Parnay, Marin County. Oh, well, we have to answer a few phone calls. People don't grow this stuff here now. We've, the ban's been in place for 10 years. All right. Um, <coughs> we, called, we called up Mendocino County. Negligible cost. We called Washington, San Juan, Washington. They didn't know because it just passed, okay? But they weren't expecting any, all right? So, you know, the actual cost, well, there are, there are staff on board the county. How much time is deflected in doing GMO-related complaints? 
close to zero, all right. And in fact, Danny Jordan, Commissioner Skundrick, Commissioner Breidenthal, all, the, all you know, on the news yesterday and at a commissioner hearing, these costs could be zero, okay? <laughs> That's their quote. Is that it? Well, with that, I'll uh, pass the mic. I, uh, <laughs>